this, this file like this. But Today we're going to talk about modeling electrical systems, which hopefully really will be reviewed for you as mostly EE students. Um, so you should be able to write down equations of motion for circuits like this, you know, including op amps and such, right? Um, and so basically, kind of the, the laws for electrical circuits are Kirchhoff's laws. And again, you can solve the differential equations once you have them using Laplace transforms. All right, so the elements of electric circuits, we'll please all review, right? So you can have passive elements such as resistors, capacitors, or inductors. You can have active elements, uh, voltage source or current source, or an op amp, right? Um, so basically, what you need to know is how voltage relates to current for all of these, right? So for these passive components, right, you have to deci decide on a direction, right? So typically, you have to decide, you know, which ways that voltage drop. So if the voltage up here is greater than down there, it's considered that voltage drops downward, current flows downward, okay? And so voltage across a resistor is proportional to uh, the current and the resistance. For a capacitor, the current across the capacitor is equal to the capacitance times dV dt. Right? So it's a function of the time derivative or how that voltage is changing across the capacitor. So again, here we've assumed a direction for, for positive voltage change and a direction for positive current flow. So these are conventions that are common. And for inductance, the voltage across an inductor is equal to the inductance times di dt. Okay. So for these voltage source or current source um, active components, essentially, you put a voltage across some nodes, that, that is the voltage across those nodes. Okay, so if it's in parallel with a resistor, that <coughs> voltage across, that if this is connected to, say, a resistor, that voltage across that resistor will always equal Vs. Okay, which could be constant, it could be a sinusoid as well, right? So similarly for a current source. If you put a current source in series with an element, that is the current flowing through that branch. So op amps are also active components. Um, so this is the schematic symbol, which hopefully you are very familiar with. Right? There usually is a positive terminal, a negative terminal. It's grounded. Whoops. And there's an output terminal. Okay, so oftentimes, okay, so the, before I get there, so the simplified circuit model of an op amp is given down here, and hopefully you've seen this as well. All right, so, <clears throat> all right, so, we're often going to assume an idealized op amp, which you've probably been doing in your past classes, right? So in an idealized op amp, this input resistance is usually assumed to be what? Infinity. Infinity, right? So this is typically infinite. The output resistance is typically zero. Right? And uh, what are these? input currents. Zero. They're zero. And then what is the difference between these input voltages? Zero. Zero. They're going to be the same. Right? So, so we have V plus minus V minus V zero. Okay? All right. Now, additionally, oftentimes that positive terminal is tied to ground. Right, so if that's tied to ground, then we'll ha have even a more simplified op amp symbol that we'll use. So you'll see this a lot. Okay. So um, now the the gain of the operational amplifier in the idealized case is what? Infinity. Infinity. Right. So you then you have infinity times zero. Right which is undefined mathematically, but in practice, essentially, you're going to look at sort of how everything else is connected to that op amp and 
Um, you know, so if, if you have an idealized op-amp, there's going to be no current flowing in here, so all the current will be flowing around it. Um, and ultimately, we'll come up and solve for what the output of that op-amp has to be. And in this circuit model, you're just going to assume that that is the out output voltage of your op-amp. Okay, so we'll look at an example a little later, but hopefully this is review. Okay, so the basic laws for electrical circuits are Kirchhoff's laws. Right? So we have Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. Okay, so the current law says that all currents leaving a node, if you sum them all up, has to equal to the sum of all currents entering the node. Right? So there's kind of this the pipe with water flowing through it analogy. So you can have all these pipes coming into a node. And they can be different sizes and different pressures, and you have this water kind of coming into this node. And then you have output pipes where water flows out, and they can be different sizes and different flow rates. Right? So if you sum all the flow rates of water coming into the node, it has to equal to the sum of all the flow rates of water exiting the node. Right? Conservation, if that didn't happen, your node would explode. It's, uh, right? So you have to have this. And the... Uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law says that the sum of the voltages around a closed path, a closed loop, has to be zero. Okay, so if you're increasing in voltage as you go across some elements, eventually you have to decrease in voltage if you, as you go across other elements so that when you come back to the same point, um, you sum all those together, you have to be zero. Okay? All right. So, in general, when you're given a circuit, you want to determine the nodes and the loops and mark your inputs and outputs. Typically, these are voltages and currents that you care about. You want to define the directions for the voltages and currents. That'll affect the signs. And then apply Kirchhoff's laws to arrive at your equations of motion. Um, these are also called dynamical equations. And someone was asking why dynamical equations. Essentially, you're going to get differential equations. And that's that means something is changing in your system, and that's why it's called a dynamical equation. All right? Okay, so let's look at this example. This is called a lead network, and we'll see why. Um, so here, uh, effectively, the input and output have already been labeled, right? So we have an output voltage, okay, and we have an input voltage, and let's find the relationship between that output voltage and that input voltage. Okay, so... Uh, what's probably the dominant, the most important node here that we... VO. Yeah, so at VO, right, so here, and so anywhere along there can be considered the node. So this is what I'm calling one here. So we can apply Kirchhoff's current law to this node, right, so let's define, so if we consider this ground, Right, and consider then across here, this will be the negative terminal, this is the positive terminal, so that's the positive direction in voltage. <coughs> okay, let's consider current flowing through the resistor as positive that way, and through the capacitor as positive that way. Right? So that means it's a voltage drop, so we're considering if that's positive current, the, the positive voltage is going to be measured from here up to there, okay? So let's call the voltage across the capacitor uh, V sub C, okay, so that's right from here to there, okay? Um, and of course we could define V sub R1 as well, but is that gonna be necessary, do you think? No, why not? It's, all the same it's the same as, as V C, right? So you could, consider a loop around here, but it's, it's going to be redundant. Um, right, so effectively, if you wrote Kirchhoff's voltage law around this loop, you're just going to say that VR1 is equal to VC. Right? And so we're just going to call this VC, whether we're talking about across the capacitor or across R1. It's the same thing. Okay? Um, and let's define then a direction of current through this resistor. A downward is positive. <coughs> Right, so that means VO is positive um, when considered from down here to up there. Okay? All right. So now let's um, 
first look at Kirchhoff's current law at node 1. Okay, so the sum of the currents coming into the node have to equal the sum of the currents going out of the node. There's only one current going out of the node. Okay. And so that current is just V out over R2. Right? And that's in that direction. Right? So that's then equal to the sum of these two currents. Well, the current through the capacitor, by definition, is C, dV, C, dT. Right? And that the direction is correct. This is a plus sign here. And then the current through R1 is that same voltage, Vc over R1. Okay. So we have this equation. Now let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around loop A. What I mean by loop A is coming around here. Okay. All right, so, so we have V in, and then we're going to have the voltage across, so this Vc, and then we're going to have VO. But let's get our signs correct, right? So if we're coming up here, that's plus V in, but when we go across here, that's minus VC <coughs> in the opposite direction of how VC was defined as positive. So we're minus VC, and now we're going to go down here, so that's also in the opposite direction of how VO was defined as positive. So we have V in minus VC minus VO, the sum of all those voltages coming around that loop has to be zero. Okay? All right, so now those are our two equations, and let's find the transfer function from V in to V out, okay? So just as a note, um, transfer functions always assume zero initial conditions, so if it's not specified, it's, it's assumed, all right? So if you will, when you have differential equations, um, and... If you re remember from differential equations class, when you solve for differential equations, you talked about particular solutions and homogeneous solutions. <laughs> Who remembers what particular solution is? Forced input? It's the solution to a forced input assuming zero initial conditions. Right? Now, what's the homogeneous solution? Zero input. It's a zero input solution, right? So assuming that the input is zero, and there might be non-zero initial conditions, what's the solution then? And then if you had both those conditions, if you had non-zero input and non-zero initial conditions, the total solution is the sum of the, the two. So you can think of transfer functions as we're finding that transfer function from V in to V out, so that transfer function is used to find the forced input solution. Okay? All right, so let's uh, come back here and see about finding that transfer function from V into V out. So how would you go about doing that? Convert it to basically 1 over SC and lump it together, V1, and not worry about doing any of that. Not worry about doing any of this? <laughs> <laughs> so you just have a voltage divider, like Z1. You could do that, right? So you look at this impedance and that impedance. Right. Yeah, so you could do that. And that might be the easiest way here. But if you had a more complex circuit, it, it might be harder to think about it in, that, in those terms. Okay, so we're going to use these equations. <laughs> That's okay. All right. <laughs> so using these equations, what would you do to try to find V out of S over V in of S? That transfer from V in to V out. Use KBL oh. to substitute out the VC in the KCL. Like essentially rearrange your KVL so you have VN minus VO equals VC and then substitute that in for VC. Exactly. Right. So we want to know how V out depends on VN. So there's this extra VC in here that we want to get rid of, right? Which is what Greg's saying that we need to get rid of that. So you can, from this lower equation, right, you can write VC is equal to VN minus V out. And then substitute that for VC in this first equation. All right, so then we'll have, I'm going to write as C, and then VC dot is just going to be V in dot minus V out dot plus 1 over R1 times VC. 
substitute that in again. So we have V in minus V out. That's going to be equal to V out over R2. And so now we have an equation that just has V out and V in. And so we can solve for the transfer function now from this equation. So how do we do that? <clears throat> so we can take the Laplace transform of this equation, right? Okay, so let's do that. All right, so we have C, which is a constant, V in dot, the Laplace transform of that, assuming zero initial conditions. <coughs> S, S, V. S, V in of S, the explicit there. Okay, and then minus the Laplace transform of V O dot, S, V O of S, right, plus 1 over R1 times Laplace transform V in, V in of S, minus V out of S. This is equal to 1 over R2, V O of S. <coughs> So now it's just algebraic manipulations to find V O of S over V in of S, the transfer function we want. Right? So let's collect all the V ins on one side and all the V outs on the other side. So on the left hand side, let's do the V ins, I guess. So we have S C um, plus 1 over R1. That times V in of S is equal to, then we have 1 over R2 plus 1 over R1 one, plus SC times V out of S. All right? Okay, so now let's divide by C. So we just have S plus something and S plus something on both sides. So we'll have S plus 1 over R1C times V in of S <coughs> divided by C divided by C. Same here. So we'll have S plus 1 over R1C plus 1 over R2C, V out S. So the transfer function then, V out S of S over V in of S is going to be, bring this over and then bring this to the denominator, we have S plus 1 over R1C over S plus 1 over R1C plus 1 over R2C. That's our transfer function. Okay? Now, why is it called a lead network? Have you guys heard of lead network before? Never? Okay. So we'll talk about it now. We'll see this a little bit later on this semester as well. Okay? So let's write this as S minus our zero over S minus our pole of our transfer function. Right? It's a first order numerator, first order denominator. Right? So Z is back to the top. Alright, so so Z is equal to minus one over R1C, and P is equal to minus 1 over R1C, let's do it this way, plus, so minus of that quantity, 1 over R2C. Okay? Now, so we're going to assume we have a real circuit, resistance is, the resistances are real, the capacitance, capacitance, is, capacitance is real. Okay, so these, these are going to be real, a real pole and a real zero. Which one has the larger magnitude? Pole. The pole has the larger magnitude, right? So if we plot this in the S plane, <coughs> so we have the real part of S and the imaginary part 
you guys. So these are both real. So the zero, they're both on the negative real axis. And the pole is going to be, have a larger magnitude. It's going to be to the left of the zero. Okay? And so, if we, we can choose some numbers for these, okay? And so, for instance, you're familiar with this, S plus 1 over S plus 10, right? That was on the entrance quiz. That is a lead network, all right? So the, the zero, okay, it's not quite scaled right, but the zero is at minus 1, the pole is at minus 10, okay? So if you plot the Bode plot, it looks like that. And it's a lean network because, um, if you recall, what a Bode plot is of, right? If you give as your input to the system some sign, pure sign, say sign of omega t, right? So unit amplitude, zero phase, the output of a linear time invariant system it's still going to be that sine, the sinusoid at that same frequency. But now, plus some phase, let's, um, plus some phase, and there might be some magnitude change, right? Where A is exactly if we call this the transfer function h of s, that a is just going to be the magnitude of h value added at j omega, where omega is the frequency of that sinusoid that you're in putting into the system. And the phase here is exactly the, the phase of h at that frequency. So this is equal to the phase of h at that frequency. So in particular, let's say you're at some frequency, you know, here. So somewhere, somewhere there, okay? So then your gain of h can be less than 1, right? So your input sinusoid is magnitude 1. Your output sinusoid is going to have some magnitude less than 1, okay? But the phase of your output it's going to be, you know, maybe 50 degrees relative to your input um, sinusoid. So it looks something like this. Right, so if you have so now as a function of time. If your input is just a sine wave at the frequency approximately 5 radians per second, okay, then your output, there's going to be some transient that happens, but then when it settles down, the output will have a magnitude that's less than the input, so it might look something like this, okay? So here is the input, and this is the output. So the output has a magnitude less than the input, and it leads the input, right? Because this is a positive phase, and so the argument of the output sign is going to reach a certain point sooner than the argument of the input, right? So the output is going to lead the input, all right? Now, we're also going to talk about lag networks later on in the semester. <coughs> and so if you flip this, right, so a lag network will be such that the zero is to the left of the pole. And if you drew the Bode plot of that, you'll, you'll end up with a negative phase and there the output would lag the input That's where the names for these networks come from all right any question all right okay so um, 
Maybe just a quick recap of the pre-lecture problem. It's a different differential equation, but it's similar in that it's a first-order differential equation. And now I said, given this differential equation, suppose you have some initial condition on y, and u is a unit step. Then what is y of t? Right? So effectively, I'm asking you to solve for the homogeneous solution and the particular solution. And the overall solution is the sum of the two. Okay, so you can apply the, the differentiation property from Laplace transforms. Right? We looked at this. Right? So in our case, we just have a first order derivative, right? df dt. So m is equal to 1. So you just have these first two terms. It's going to the Laplace transform of df dt is s f of s minus f of 0. Right? We've pointed that especially here. Right? So a lot of times, we'll have zero initial conditions, or when you're computing tra transfer functions, you're going to assume zero initial conditions. So then the Laplace transform of DFDT in those cases is just S F of S. But in this case, we actually have a non-zero initial condition, so we need to factor that in. So taking the Laplace transform of this equation, then you have S Y of S minus that initial condition, just using that differentiation property, plus 4 Y of S is equal to 5 u n of s. Okay. Then you solve for y of s, right, and you'll get this. Right? So, so by using that differentiation property, we are in one fell swoop solving for the homogeneous solution and the particular solution at the same time. Right? If you wanted to do them separately, you could assume <coughs> that this is 0, right? so ignore this, and solve for the particular solution, and then Later on, solve separately for the, I don't know why, how it changes. Um, then you can solve separately for the homogeneous solution where you're assuming the input is zero. And then you sum them together, right? So effectively, right, if you think of this, bring this to the other side, right? Then you're, you have the components of your particular solution and homogeneous solution. Right? So working things out, you should get two terms for y of s. Right? It's just from this equation where u n of s is 1 over s, right? because u n of t is the unit step. Right? So this then is your particular solution. This is your homogeneous solution. The overall solution is the sum of the two. Right. And you can do a partial fraction expansion on this part. You'll get that. You still have that term. And then you can combine these two to get this. And then you invert <coughs> and you get that. All right? OK. So about 80% um, got the, this question correct. I think the most popular wrong choice was one where you forgot to include this initial condition. Okay, so you just solve for the, the forced, the particular solution. Okay, any questions? All right, here. Okay, so some announcements and reminders. Uh, now that everyone's here, I usually try to do these more in the middle of the class because a lot of people tend to, or some people tend to walk in a little bit after the start of class. Okay, so. Um, Pre-lecture problems uh, that are on D2L, if you answered it, you can go back after class and uh, view the question. It'll point at which choice you chose, and it'll also uh, point out which is the correct choice. Um, and you basically will click on your attempt to see that. If you didn't answer the problem, you, there's no attempt to view. You actually can't see that problem. I did check with D2L the D2L staff on a way that people could still see it, and they said that's a limitation of D2L. Okay, so definitely uh, at least try to answer it um, so that you could go back and, and take a look. Um, I will generally briefly uh, go over the problems in class, perhaps not necessarily that day, possibly the, the time after, depending on where it fits into the lecture. Um, also, someone had asked, you know, they had been alerted 
um, a couple of times on, on when the pre-lecture problem was due, but then they weren't alerted other times, so they forgot to do it. Um, the D2L staff said that's actually an, uh, something you can set up in your login, how you want to be alerted or notified of things. Um, so look on um, the D2L <coughs> alerts page to, to figure out how you want to set up your alerts. Okay. So a reminder that homework one is due Friday by 5 o'clock. I think we've covered most everything um, that's needed. I'll have a couple more examples um, which might help out some, some more. And then um, project handout for 5138 students. So does anybody still, I have a few extras if, if people need it. Um, and okay, so I'm just going to look on this. So if you're a 5138 student you know, for the credit, for the graduate level credit, um, you're required to do a project. I'm hoping it'll be something that you design that you're very interested in. And I have intermediate deadlines, which you already saw on the uh, course calendar. Um, and these intermediate deadlines, in part, are to keep you on track so that you're making good progress towards the final deadline. And also gives me a chance to provide some feedback along the way. Okay? So I'm meaning for you for the projects to be done in pairs. Uh, if you need help finding a partner, uh, email me by this Friday, and I'll uh, try to introduce uh, those of you, at least by email. If I get the emails before Friday's class, I'll try to introduce you in the class if you guys are here. All right? Um, and then I have a list of sample project ideas. If you have something in mind that's not on here, definitely feel free to come talk with me. Um, so these range from choosing a particular you know, plant of interest and coming up with a model and defining some performance specifications you'd like for your plant and then designing controllers using at least two different techniques um, that we've discussed this year <coughs> and then simulating, evaluating um, how the different controllers work. And then if you want to do a hardware project, you can look at available hardware setups in ITLL. So for the digital control class, which I teach, um, I've had past students do an inverted pendulum stabilization problem. Um, so there are a number of interesting setups in ITL that you can uh, take a look at to see if you want to do an actual control design and implement it on a hardware. So this is obviously, in many ways, more involved. And so for this project, I only ask you to just design a controller using any technique that we've discussed um, this semester. And if you can get a working implementation, I think that would be pretty neat. Now, some people, and there's already one person who already came to talk with me, was interested in building their own hardware experiment. So if you're interested in that, that's also fine as well. Um, that's pretty ambitious. Um, but I've actually had uh, in the digital control class, the other class I teach, um, someone do that and came up with a very, very nice design, built it all, designed a controller, got it all to work, and then for that class looked at sample rate effects. Um, so for all of these, um, the main goal is if you do any hardware implementation, make sure sampling is fast enough that there are no sample rate effects. Um, and we can discuss that if you're unsure what that exactly means in your situation. It will depend on your, the dynamics of the system. You want the sample rate to be much, much, much faster than the dominant dynamics of the system. Okay. Um, and then there was someone who came to talk to me on, you know, are we going to cover such and such in this class? And, and there were some advanced topics that this person was interested in. And so if you want to do a more kind of directed focus study on some aspect of advanced controls that we're not going to cover in this class, that's also a possibility. All right. So... Are there any questions, particularly from 5138 students? Um, so this class is about one quarter 5138 students and three quarters 4138 students. So if you have questions, definitely feel free um, to come talk with me. All right? Okay. And I'll get the other thing up again. Okay, so 
<clears throat> okay, let's look at an op amp example. Let's see, this should be review. Um, okay, so let's write out the equations relating V in to V out, or V out in, as a function of V in. And so we're going to apply, which law do you think we'll apply? KVL, that's one possibility. What's the other? KVL. <laughs> yeah, so here, um, so we're assuming, right, an ideal op amp, and we're going to assume V plus is grounded. Right, so, so, and that there's an infinite input resistance, so there's no current. This, oh no, yeah, that's a, it must reset. Um, so we will get to that, because <laughs> um, I definitely said it before class. Okay, um, all right, so I'm going to write on here. Um, so we're assuming that this input current is zero, because the, the input resistance is infinite. Right, so the current's going to come around, and so, so what we want to do is apply KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, to this node, all right? And so if we, let's see if I can get the pen, pen up, all right, so, so at this node, so there's ground, and so by definition, the, the VN, we're going to assume is plus here and, you know, goes to ground, right? And so since we're assuming no currents here, and effectively if V plus is tied to ground and V minus is equal to V plus, then this is also tied to ground, right? So if, if then we define our current going that way and voltage V in is the, this V in, is the same as the voltage across Rn. Does everyone see that? Okay, so that current is going to be Vn over Rn, right? So that current is the current going in. And we can add the current coming in from this branch, which is, I called it I out there. All right, and what is that? So if this is tied to ground, we can also, and we um, define that as the direction of current, then we have V out over R. Right, so the sum of those two, sum of the currents coming into the node is equal to the sum of currents going out of the node. And so there's, we've said that this is zero here. There's no current there. So we have that. Everyone see that? Okay, so V out then is equal to <clears throat> minus R over R in times V in. Right, so this is just a gain function. This op amp is set up just to apply a particular gain, and you can choose that gain by choosing these resistances. Okay? All right, so. Any questions? So you guys already a preview here. Um, now let's look at this op amp circuit. What, which equation best describes it? Okay, so it's similar, a little bit different than the one we just did. We'll start this. I... B, C, C. So first, work it out on your own, and then we'll see where everybody is. I mean, it is CB. That's what you're asking. Okay. Let it run up to maybe one minute there. Okay. So 
Five more seconds. All right. Okay, so I'm going to stop. Here. <laughs> All right. Stop it there. Okay, so there is a spread of answers. So now talk with your neighbors um, and discuss. So if you know the answer, so I do want to see discussion. If you know the answer, um, definitely still discuss with someone else. If you don't know how to go about it, also ask for help and discuss. All right? Okay, so discuss, and then I'll start the poll again. You don't have a clicker? Okay. So it's so clicker is just uh, okay. optional extra credit. Yeah. But you still participate. In, yeah. You bought a new one? Yeah. And this bastard had my old one. Oh, seriously? Oh, my God. Okay. How did that happen? Yeah. Let him borrow it. Yeah. It's been a hot minute back in the I forgot about that. Do you have anything right after this? Oh, yeah. That's a trip. I looked at the thing. I'm like, I don't think this is my original clicker. And then I look on the back and it says KE. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to shut it off. And uh, very good. <laughs> All right, so just the oh. previous time was like that. All right, so D is correct. All right. Okay. All right. So does anybody want to go over it? You're pretty clear on it. So it's the same, you do the same thing as we did in the earlier example. You're going to apply KCL at this node, okay? But since this is a capacitor, right, the current is C, D, V, D, T, right, where D, V, D, T is D, V out D, T, right? And then you just rearrange it, and it ends up being this, okay? All right. So... All right, so then maybe going back, because this looking, uh, listening to some of the questions that came up in, in office hours, um, and also seeing some non-parallel structure in how the book presents things. So just providing a little bit more information here, in the last few minutes here. So the basic laws for mechanical systems um, is Newton's second law for translational motion and rotational motion. <coughs> Sum of all forces on a mass equals to its mass times this acceleration, okay? That's mine. I want to make sure I don't go over. Yeah, what? I don't have another quiz. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then for rotational moment, uh, motion, the sum of the moments acting on an object is equal to its moment of inertia times its angular acceleration, okay? And the moment of inertia needs to be computed about, you know, you needed to find your coordinates, so it has to be computed about a pivot point, and, uh, and, um, and you have to be also uh, clear in where the center of mass is. Okay, so the particular example we did was very simple in that it was uh, a pendulum with all its mass at the end, so obviously the center of mass is there. Um, in homework, you're looking at a uniform rod, and so that center of mass is going to be along the center of that rod. Okay? Yeah, Jake? Uh, I was looking at moments of inertia, and actually, the one that you're the homework, the 1 over 3 times ml squared, right? That's the moment of inertia of a thin rod anchored at the end of it. Yes. So it's not, so you don't do the center of mass, you do the length? 
So there, so there's two things, right? So there is, so here, the moment of inertia was ml squared, right? So, so you need to know the moment of inertia, which is computed based on the configuration. Here, all that mass is at the end. This had length l in, in homework, right? So this is computed for this with all the mass in the end, and the center mass is at the end. Okay, in homework, you have a thin, solid rod pendulum of length L. So now the center of mass is going to be in the center. The moment of inertia is also different. But the reason you need to know this is to compute the moment due to, the gra due to gravity. Yes. Yeah, right, so here you had the force of gravity, and then you had to resolve what the component is that's perpendicular to the rod, and then you multiply by that distance from the pivot point to the center of mass. Here. <laughs> I, agree, I agree with that, but I think the, for a, a long rod like that with the center of mass at the center, like you're, and we use L over 2 to, to do the torque, isn't the inertia 1 over 12 ml squared and not 1 third ml squared? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I, I, I did it both ways. Oh, because, short okay. video, But I think the 1 over 3rd refers to the full length of the rod. Um, so at the end, using the... Oh, I'll have to think about that because you have to integrate out. But the, yeah, the pivot point, is, so it's about this pivot point. Yeah. Um, just use the 1 third ml squared that the problem Yeah, so if and you I'm use pretty one sure that's actually correct. 1 but I, third yeah. ml squared d then you don't do the L over 2 for your center of mass. That's, that's what I'm getting. So. No, no, okay, I'm still doing the L over 2, but I'll double check that, okay? All right, okay, any other questions? All right, so I added this because of some questions um, in office hours, and uh, just to be parallel, they, the book has a, a diagram of all the, you know, the main elements of uh, electric circuits. So these are elements that you can see in mechanical systems. You should be familiar with all of this from freshman physics, right? So it might have a spring, a damper, you know, or friction. Um, and so the spring force, and so for all of these, you want to know how the force relates to displacement or velocity, right? So for a spring, when a spring is sitting at its natural length, there's no force, right? So, but then if you pull on it, there's a spring force pulling back, right? And so if we think of displacement as positive to the right, okay, then the, the uh, force of the spring, as you pull things to the right, the force of the spring is going to be pulling it's going to be pulling back to the left, which is why the minus sign. And how much it's going to be pulling back is the spring constant times the, the displacement minus the rest displacement, whatever that is. Oftentimes, this is defined as zero, but not necessarily. Okay? For a damper, the force is proportional to the velocity. Okay? And again, it acts opposite in the opposite direction of motion. So if your velocity is, you know, is moving to the right, the, the damping force is to the left. And friction is very similar to damping, right? So it's also proportional to the velocity. Okay, so you want to draw your free body diagram, look at uh, the different forces that might be acting on the system, and some of the forces, these are all translational, some of the forces is equal to the mass, so if you have a mass attached to the spring and such, it's equal to mass times its acceleration. So these are all translational versions. There are rotational versions. You can have a rotational spring, rotational damper, rotational friction. So all very, very similar. Okay? All right. So just then to summarize modeling of mechanical and electrical systems, you want to assign all the variables of interest. So position, angular position, velocities, current, voltage. For mechanical systems, you want to draw a free body diagram, define the coordinate system, the zero positions, positive directions. Electrical systems, you need to list all the nodes and loops that are critical to address um, and define directions of voltage and current. Um, then apply Newton's 
laws for mechanical systems, Kirchhoff's laws for electrical systems to come up with your differential equations, and you can use Laplace transforms to solve the differential equations. Okay, so we've just done a basic review. You should be able to piece things together if you have multiple masses. Um, so basically, if you have, say, these two masses here, and they're at some distance apart, then there's going to be a spring force acting this way on this mass. It's going to be equal and opposite to the spring force acting that way on this mass. Okay, so that takes the third law, but you should be have seen this before. We probably will not go beyond two separate masses and things that we do, but it would just build up similar. Okay? All right. So we'll go ahead and wrap up there. I do have office hours. Uh, if you have questions, if you can't make my office hours, you can email me to try to meet at some other time. Okay.